So I'm going to be talking today about my master's thesis work, which I completed a couple years ago now. Um, and I had a lot of collaborators. Um, Scott Nielsen gave the presentation earlier, uh, Vic Liefers, both from the U of A, uh, Barry White, and Tim Vinge. So most of you are probably familiar with what a seismic line is, but just uh, for those who may not be, uh, these are linear disturbances uh, cleared through or a force corridor, also known as a cut line. Uh, they're used for energy exploration or oil and gas exploration. They tend to range from more on the narrow side, from about 2 meters up to 10 meters wide. Um, there's two different kind of classifications that I'm just going to mention here. So two-dimensional seismic lines are used for coarse delineation. These tend to be wider lines. And then we have 3D seismic lines, which is for more detailed well placement. And you can see in some of the pictures here, this is sort of this dense network of narrower 3D lines. And this could be an example here of a 2D seismic line, which is a bit wider, cutting through the forest. So what is the issue with some of these seismic lines? Well, they're very extensive across the boreal forest, uh, then leading to things like forest fragmentation and habitat loss. They allow for increased human access into interior habitats, which can also open up access for things like invasive species as well. Um, they've been shown to lead to some changes in the behavioral responses of some different boreal species. And one of the most well-known examples right now is uh, implications for threatened woodland caribou. Uh, the, as you may be aware, the federal caribou strategy uh, calls for 65% of caribou range to be undisturbed. And that means it has to be 100 meters or 500 meters away from any anthropogenic uh, feature disturbance. So even though seismic lines might be very narrow, only a few meters wide, uh, this extensive network, once buffered by these 500 meters, is actually representing a very large disturbance um, with implications for this uh, caribou recovery strategy. So I focused my, my study just on 2D, or these wider legacy seismic lines in northeastern Alberta. The study I had was just south of Fort McMurray in the Stony Mountain 800 area. It was approximately 180,000 hectares, primarily in the central mixed wood. Um, it did contain uh, caribou herds within this region. Um, and it also had a very large network of legacy seismic lines contributing to this total human footprint in the area. So there was just over 3,000 kilometers of lines, and about half of these were 2D or legacy seismic lines. And you can see the picture of that here. So there have been a number of past studies looking at um, regeneration on seismic lines, but I wanted to contribute to this uh, growing network of knowledge by understanding regeneration processes on these lines in order to facilitate spatially explicit projections that could be used in things like mapping, planning, or management. I wanted to use a metric to understand regeneration that was very straightforward for implementation. And I wanted to take advantage of the available remote sensing and GIS data sets that we have in this province. So I have two objectives here. So one was to understand the factors that were affecting regeneration to a three meter height, which is my response variable. And from there, I wanted to predict the regeneration probability over the landscape. And I'm going to focus most of the talk on this first objective here, as it pertains more to the wet areas mapping. And from there, using information from the first objective, I wanted to actually optimize restoration of seismic lines using these regeneration probabilities. So I obtained LIDAR data uh, from the government of Alberta. Um, and that's how I was able to measure the heights on the seismic lines. So I used the LIDAR point cloud, as you can kind of see a visualization here, the LIDAR point cloud. I know you saw a lot nicer visualizations earlier. Um, you can kind of see right here it would be like a little well pad and then a seismic line running there. So from the point cloud, um, I created a digital surface model kind of representing the highest points on the landscape. Then I created a digital elevation model representing the ground points or lowest elevation on the landscape. By subtracting the digital elevation model, so the lower from the higher, I could get my canopy height model and I did this at a two meter resolution. So I had basically the highest height across my study area for every two meter by two meter area. So once I had my canopy height model, 
I then had an inventory of seismic lines which I could sample to look at the regeneration or growth on these lines. So I had about 800 sample plots, um, each 2 by 50 meters wide, and I only took lines that were greater than 3 meters in width because you could get some error from the adjacent canopy in terms of LIDAR, kind of giving you a biased result. So I had to stick to wider lines based on the data that I had available. So this picture here just shows an example of a seismic line, uh, the network there, and I'd be able to take plots centered on these lines. So I had a number of predictor variables about what might be uh, affecting or influencing regeneration on these lines after they've been cleared uh, for exploration. So number one uh, being the time since disturbance, or the time since they were cleared or cut, um, representing human activity or access. Uh, I used a proxy for this uh, and used the distance to roads, considering that areas that are closer to a major road are more likely to be used by uh, maybe ATVs. Some characteristics of the line, such as the width of the line, which may relate not only to light conditions, but also to potentially the equipment used to clear a line, as well as the orientation. Some stand characteristics, such as the stand age, which kind of represents some of the fire history, and the ecosite, that was uh, the seismic line was in the stand contained within it. And a terrain variable, which was the depth to water, and this was from the wet areas mapping data. And I looked at some interactions as well between the depth to water and the time since disturbance, as well as the depth to water and the distance to the nearest road. So some of the data sources I had uh, to tell me these predictor variables was a lineal inventory done by Greenlink Forestry, um, which we, we already saw, uh, AVI data, um, which gave me also information about ecosite, and wet areas mapping data, which we're all very familiar with by now. So from there, um, I a priori selected a number of different models that describe things like stand, light, the disturbance history, or terrain moisture. And again, the response variable um, was either, yes, this plot had reached a three meter height on the seismic line, or no, it had not. So there was just yes or no, it either had or it hadn't. And that's what I was trying to predict with the models. So through model selection, um, I chose the most supported model. And it included all the variables that I described before, as well as a key interaction between the time since disturbance and the depth to water. And surprise, uh, depth to water, the wet areas mapping, was a very influential variable. And ecocide as well was very influential. So I'm not going to go into all these numbers because I know it's late in the day. Uh, but what it's basically showing is all the predictor variables that influence this three meter recovery target. The ones that are highlighted in yellow uh, were kind of considered the most influential. So things particularly like the ecocyte, J, which is an fen, had a very strong negative relationship with that seismic line reaching the three meter recovery target. And then we see down here the wet areas mapping, and I'll go a little bit more into the depth to water relationship, was also a very strong predictor, um, as well as line width and the distance to the nearest road. So I'm just going to focus in on this first relationship. So we have the probability of regeneration to that three meter height, or sort of a trajectory towards recovery on the y axis there. And if we look at the depth to water, which we used a log 10 relationship for depth to water. Um, and then we have time here. So in this bottom dotted line, this is after 10 years since clearing. Then we have 30 years in the dashed line and the solid line is 50 years. So within 10 years, we see um, a high probability of regenerating at sort of these mesic level, a moisture level of depth to water. In the very wet areas, we see much more limited recovery, and again, with the very more dry areas or higher depth to water. But we start to lose this relationship, which represents that interaction with time. So after 30 or 50 years, you see that in the dry sites, we are reaching three meters, or there's a high probability of it, but you're still seeing more limitation in those very wet areas, which is also similar to what we might see um, coming from the data about being in a fen or a bog. Uh, line width, the wider the line, the less probability of regeneration, as we expect, and the distance to road, uh, the further away, as we hypothesized, the higher likelihood of reaching a three meter 
recovery height. So now that we have this model, uh, what can we do with it? So we're able to predict a continuous uh, regeneration probability surface. Um, so here's a map on the, the top on the left. You can see the regeneration probability um, after 10 years post-disturbance predicted over the landscape uh, from 0 to 1. So the dark green being the areas more likely to regenerate. And we had to hold line width and orientation to their mean value for this. Then you can see as it changes from 30 years to 50 years where we actually see much of the landscape um, has a very high probability of reaching 3 meters. Then if we take a classification threshold, uh, and we can look at those black and white maps, um, the threshold determines whether we can really consider something to be regenerated or not at that time. Uh, just a little bit easier to, to understand the changes. So sort of maybe a third of the landscape looking like within 10 years it might reach 3 meters in some of these seismic lines. Um, but then even after 50 years, there's still quite a few areas that are predicted not to reach a 3 meter height. So if you want to know more information, uh, spe specifics about this study, we do have a paper in biological conservation. Um, or if you really want more specifics, you can read the thesis. Um, so the second part here, I'm just going to go into briefly. So um, now we have this map predicting uh, regeneration probabilities across the landscape of seismic line. Um, what might be a useful next step to use with this? So what we did is, um, if you think about the cost of reclamation, it's very expensive to reclaim seismic lines. So predictions from $8,000 to $12,000 per kilometer. So it costs millions of dollars to restore all these lines kind of in one go. So an idea could be to concentrate reclamation to moderately disturbed sites. So a high degree of success for a low cost. So we incorporated things like the bitumen pay thickness, linear density map, uh, the regeneration probability maps that we used from or created from the first part of the objective or study there, some priority caribou restoration uh, sites, as well as the seismic lines for the area. And so using all of this information in an optimization pro program called Marks and Zones, we were able to uh, get an understanding of regeneration probability when thinking about how to get sort of the best bang for your buck in terms of where to restore. So from that analysis, we can get an output map like this, where we have all the seismic line segments uh, depicted into either one of three potential zones. So an active zone, which would be an area where maybe we want to focus active reclamation. Um, this could be things like uh, mounding, planting, things that cost money. Um, then there's maybe the ideal segments of seismic lines that are better for passive regeneration. So these would be areas that are predicted to naturally come back on their own. And so maybe the only intervention is just keeping ATVs or other users off these lines or reuse. And then there's those available zones. Either these areas might come back um, so easily on their own that we don't need to apply any regeneration. They're either very, very difficult to reclaim, or there's a lot of activity, economic uh, development potential on these, um, likely to be these lines are going to be reused for some reason, and so you don't want to invest your resources there. So creating some of these spatial regeneration maps allows us to do some optimization analyses and test some different scenarios about where some of the best areas would be to restore these seismic lines and to benefit something like caribou. And you can include other biodiversity information as well. So in summary, uh, the variation in regeneration of the seismic lines was very complex. Um, but we did find that the wet areas mapping uh, was a very strong predictor, as well as ecosite, particularly fens and bogs. And using these useful map products, such as regeneration predictions across the landscape, we can then start to spatially optimize some seismic line restoration to get sort of the best bang for your buck. Um, I have lots of people who have helped with this, this research over the years. I um, just want to thank you to all of them.